Welcome to the John Doe Radio Show. I am your host, John Doe. Thank you for joining me. Man, it feels good to be back. I cannot say how awesome it was to produce the show this week for you guys. We're going to be talking about news. We're going to have interviews. We're going to talk about grow tips. We're going to talk about hash, flour, all kinds of things here on the John Doe Radio Show. Once a week, we're going to try and bring you the best of news, the best of information that we possibly can. I started this show way back in 2007 as a passion project, something that I wanted to not only get involved in the cannabis community with, but to learn about weed and then to help educate and make other people feel comfortable about their choice to use cannabis. We're going to try and keep the show focused and not try and wonder too much, but if you know me, then you already know that's the JDR way. So welcome, thank you, enjoy the ride, and we're going to have some very cool things for you in the future. Sponsors, giveaways, awesome interviews. That's the one big thing I'm looking forward to is talking to other people, educating me about the cannabis industry. So let's get to it. It's the John Doe Radio Show. How much higher can you get? Never get trying to make it. Woman, can't you see? Takes a lot of fun to make it. Let's talk truthfully, truthfully, truthfully. News stories this week that we'll get to. Obviously, California legalization going into effect January 1st. We'll talk about the fires in california also i'll review with you real quickly we'll go through legal recreational and medical states to date one of the big stories that i'm going to be covering here on jdr is social use and why haven't we filled the gaps with social use here in colorado other states going to be doing a way better job than we've done we'll talk about that today quite a bit and we'll get into it like i said in the future hopefully having emmett reistroffer the head of Initiative 300, the social use campaign here in Denver on to talk more about the details of what's going on and why things are happening the way that they are happening. I also got some weird fish story at the end of the podcast and why fish were being fed marijuana pellets. I got to be honest with you. It's just kind of ridiculous. It's JDR. I think it's important we start JDR off with review of both legal recreational states and legal medical states. We'll try and make it through the medical side of things as quickly as possible. That list has grown quite extensive, but I think it's important to list a few details from each state, not just the legal medical state name. We'll start on the recreational side of things. Alaska, adults 21 and over, uh, voted for legalization in 2015. We'll talk about Alaska more and more as the show goes on, as time goes on, because that's obviously a huge news story that is unfolding. Their regulatory process unfolds. California, we'll talk a lot about California today. In January, they will unfold their legalization. It's been a slow rollout as far as regulation for local municipalities goes, uh, in order to have approval to open up your shop, you're going to need local approval and state approval licenses. And like I said, we'll get into that more here as the show goes on. Colorado has had legalization for a minute now. Um, In fact, we hit $1 billion in legal marijuana sales this year, a month earlier than we did last year, which is pretty cool. So if we have time, maybe we'll get to that uh, at the end of the show. And something else that's interesting, too, the sales tax on cannabis. And I didn't believe this at first. I had to look this up. I had to question people. Uh, you know, double take when you see the news article come up, like on Facebook or whatever. But last year, legal marijuana sales made more in taxes than legal alcohol sales. I don't know why I said legal alcohol sales. <laughs> we're, we're not in prohibition, bro. We're not still in prohibition. But uh, that's an interesting fact and something that uh, kind of took a minute to settle in. And when you tell people about that here in Colorado, their faces, you know, they kind of have that questioning look of like, are you crazy? You freaking hippie. Go away with your crazy stoner facts. But it's true. Uh, Next state here, Maine. Maine will have retail stores in 2018, it's possibly looking like. We'll talk more about Maine when we talk about social use here uh, 
later in the show also. Massachusetts, on December 15th, Massachusetts began allowing residents to carry and consume small amounts of weed and grow up to 12 plants in their homes. The future of the state's adult use market remains hazy, says businessinsider.com. A bill signed by the governor over the holidays uh, last year delayed the timetable for opening retail stores from early 2018 to mid-year. And we'll also talk a lot more about Massachusetts. We'll bring Bike in and maybe uh, use some of his connections to talk to some people out there who are opening up businesses. Uh, Nevada, exciting state to have legalization roll out. And we'll talk a lot about Nevada when it comes to social use because it's a very, very, very important topic to me and something that we're going to be covering a lot here in the near future on JDR and try and affect some change here in Colorado because it's silly to me. It's absolutely crazy and I won't get off on this tangent now because I have a whole new story about this. I think it's crazy. We still haven't solved the social use problem here in Colorado, but Nevada, it's looking like right off the bat, they're going to allow local municipalities Uh, free reign to go ahead and uh, make rules however they want to make them no restrictions on a statewide level which basically says please bring it you know let's 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 have this and it would be impossible for me to believe that las vegas uh, would not have some sort of social use bars facilities uh, hangouts whatever it's going to evolve to be that's the exciting part is that there's still parts of this industry and businesses that have yet to unfold and it's exciting to think about what that future could look like and what those businesses could be and the models that they take on one of the models about one one of the Oh, this would be the last thing I say about this. I didn't want to get off of the topic too much because, like I said, this is going to take a while to get through these. Um, one of the interesting things to talk about when it comes to about uh, talking about social use is the business model is heavily restrictive in a lot of these places. You can't serve food. Uh, you can't. You know, it's, it's even questionable in some places whether you can even let people. You can serve people water, which is absolutely crazy. Um, but we'll talk more about that, and uh, the, the business model is going to be something important. The emerging uh, productive and money-making business model when it comes to social use is going to be interesting to see what that is. Anyway, uh, moving on. Nevada, uh, Oregon, next state that had legalized weed on this list in summer of 2015. Oregonians got the green light to carry up to an ounce of weed and grow up to four plants at home. It's also legal to give edibles as a gift so long as they're ingested in private I don't know why that one little side note was listed here by uh, uh, the Business Insider. Oregon enjoyed knockout sales during the state's first year of legal marijuana. Dispensaries generated nearly $15 million in tax revenue between July 2015 and June 2016. Next state, Washington. Dispensaries in Washington raked in over $1 billion in non-medical marijuana sales since the drug was legalized for recreational use back in 2012. The state allows people to carry up to one ounce of marijuana, but they must require uh, but they must require the drug for medicinal, pur- medicinal purposes in order to be eligible for a grower's license so you could smoke it but not grow it if you're uh, toking for fun. In Washington, D.C., residents of the nation's capital voted overwhelmingly in favor to legalize non-medical marijuana in November 2014. The bill took effect almost a year ago, allowing people to possess up to uh, two ounces of the pot and gift up to an ounce if neither money nor goods or services are exchanged. Interesting note about Washington, D.C., which you may already know, but you may not. Washington, D.C.'s laws must be okayed by Congress. So it's not just something that can be put into place without a congressional approval. And how it's done a lot of the time is these new laws are attached to the end of like budget bills and then approved through like that budget bill. So it's just a weird way that some of the rules and laws are passed into play. Let's get on to the medical states. Alaska in 1998, one ounce usable, six plants, three mature, three immature. Arizona, Proposition 203 in 2010, two and a half ounces usable with 12 plants. Arkansas, 2016, three and a half ounce usable per 14 day period. We'll talk about Arkansas's rules a lot more here on the JDR in the future also because it's a state that's quickly unfolding both medical and possibly soon recreational. Uh, I know 
recreational is not already happening in Arkansas, but the talk and the buzz that I hear about Arkansas is different than a lot of other places that you hear about it. Anyway, we'll talk about that more. Uh, California, Proposition 215, obviously, in 1996. We don't really need to go over uh, rules in California because it kind of depends on where you're at in California, what the rules are there. Uh, January 1st, though, things are going to start to come together there. Uh, recreational wise and then we'll see what happens with the medical side of things that's always one of the most interesting sides to watch is uh, Colorado Oregon Washington California is going to be the next state that we look to to see what happens to the medical side of things here in Colorado it's very important to keep your medical card for a few different reasons but one particular reason that sticks out to me and a lot of other people is the tax rate saving money on the tax rate That's something that's going to be very important for other states to make sure that they get right, to make sure that the black market is kept at bay. It's the one reason why that I can point to that keeps the black market steady 100 percent. Well, maybe not 100 percent, but pretty heavy. uh, The reason why the black market still exists is because these ridiculous high tax rates that you have in dispensaries. So the success of legal markets in some states, I think, is going to hinge on making sure that you keep these tax rates within a certain bracket. And every state that rules out legalization and local municipalities have talks about having crazy high. This is something that's going to be a huge topic and we need to stay on top of and we need to make sure that the other side knows if you want to try and eliminate the black market, taxing this out the yin yang is probably not the answer. Colorado was my next state on the list in the year 2000. Two ounce usable, uh, six plants, three mature, three immature. That was, of course, Amendment 20. Connecticut in 2012, two and a half ounces usable. Delaware in 2011, six ounces usable. Florida is another one we'll be talking about a lot more in the future. 2016, Hawaii in 2000, four ounce usable, seven plants. Illinois, two and a half ounce of usable cannabis during a period of 14 days. Uh... Where was he at? Oh, yeah, I just said Illinois. Maine, in 1999, two and a half ounces, usable, six plants. Maryland, 2014, 30-day supply. Uh, Massachusetts, in 2012, 60-day supply for personal medical use, up to 10 ounces. In Michigan, 2008, two and a half ounces, usable, uh, 12 plants. Minnesota, 2014, 30-day supply of non-smokable marijuana. One of the most interesting rules. Uh, you can't have smokable marijuana, which is weird when you read it that way because you're like, what, what the? How do you, how do you have non-smokable marijuana? Edibles. That's basically what it comes down to is edibles. Montana, 2004, one ounce usable, four plants mature with 12 seedlings allowed. Nevada in 2000, two and a half ounce usable, 12 plants. New Hampshire in 2013, two ounces of usable cannabis during a 10 day period. New Jersey in 2010, two ounce usable. New Mexico in 2007, six ounce usable, 16 plants, four mature and 12 immature. New York's the next one in the list in 2014, 30 day supply of non smokable. Marijuana. North Dakota, 2016, three ounces per 14 day period. Ohio, 2016, maximum of a 90 day supply. Oregon, another place we'll be talking a lot about on JDR. I have some connections in Oregon that we'll be getting some inside information from. Pennsylvania in 2016 with 30 day supply. Rhode Island, 2006, two and a half ounces usable, 12 plants. Vermont in 2004, two ounce usable, nine plants, two mature, seven immature. Washington in 1998, eight ounce usable, six plants. Washington, D.C. in 2010, two ounce dried. A side note on Washington, D.C., I talked to you about early, or I talked to you earlier about how laws were implemented in Washington, D.C. It took 10 years. 10 years for Washington, D.C. to implement, or I guess I should say for Congress to approve Washington, D.C. to implement their medical marijuana program. At the time, it was the highest approval percentage by a vote of the people for medical marijuana, period. And it took 10 years for Congress to implement this rule. Just crazy. West Virginia in 2017 with Senate Bill 386, a 30-day supply. And that is the list of legal medical states and legal recreational states. Let's keep it growing. John Doe. 
three states come online next year with legal recreational sales, none bigger than California. Obviously, we're going to be covering California a ton as they unfold their regulatory process. It's going to be a giant, and the rules and coverage that goes along with it, uh, we're going to try and stay as detailed as possible because it's important that you do follow what goes on in California because it is going to change the face of recreational cannabis uh, cannabis as a whole across the nation when they start to unroll these uh, these rules and more particularly talking about how the money that's going to be coming into this is used and the amount of money that's going to be coming into California is absolutely going to be astronomical. Um, California aiming to open retail marijuana stores starting January 1st. Massachusetts and Maine plan to open stores next summer. Uh, this article coming from CNN Money we obviously still have a lot to do, but yes, we're going to be ready to go on January 1st, says Alex Traverso, spokesman for the Bureau of Cannabis Control in California. We will be issuing new regulations in November, so we're hard at work on those at the present time. Something to note about California is that not everywhere is going to have, we're talking about local municipalities, are going to have rules in place and have approved businesses to operate in these areas. So we, we talked about it before. California, you're going to need local approval and you're going to need state approval at the very minimum. There'll be other rules and other hoops that you'll have to jump through and we'll get into those specific rules as time goes on. There's just way too much to cover today. But that's the big thing is that you have local approval and then it, you get state approval. And a lot of the Local municipalities are going to have pretty much a temporary approval process in place while they hammer down rules a little bit more because it's been slow. As far as local municipalities go, I think L.A. County issue or L.A. County in particular is going to we'll get to that in a minute because that's a crazy news story in Malibu. Two businesses have been issued licenses in L.A. County where licenses businesses are not allowed in L.A. County quote unquote so that that's a crazy story we'll get to that in a minute if i don't get to it then i'll remind myself when i listen back to the show and mark it down in my notes but no i, I will and i'm sure you guys will remind me dude you said you were going to cover this and you didn't cover this welcome back to jdr <laughs> Among the checklist of expected regulations is new oversight on water usage like drip irrigation and reusing water waste that could prove expensive for marijuana businesses. Other rules will require licensing and background checks for distributors and safety and education training for consumers. Dispensaries like Green Alternative, which has 10,000 patients in San Diego, are getting ready to add non-medical customers to their clientele. Zach Lazarus, COO of Green Alternative, says we are in the process of stockpiling cannabis in order to fulfill the market needs. That story hit an interesting curveball this week with the fires or last week, uh, however long the fires have been going in California. And again, we'll talk about that here with a story coming up and how it's affected not only the uh, cannabis situation, but also wineries in the area, too, the, the, in the areas where these fires have most heavily affected. Uh, the where was I at here? Oh yeah, the C, the COO of Green Alternative. We're in the process of stockpiling cannabis. He says we believe there will be a huge rush. We go through two to four pounds per day on average, and we anticipate going through three to four times as much when they open the doors for recreational use. This requires not only stockpiling pot, but negotiating hurdles on the state and local level for licensing, zoning, taxation, and other issues. Executive Director of Normal said it might take longer than January to set up the regulation process and to work out how the new recreational market will exist alongside its already quite large medical market. As I just kind of told you um, before that local municipalities are not a lot of no, local municipalities are just not going to be prepared for that January 1st date so there's been rules put into place for like I think it's a three or four month uh, temporary permit that's being allowed in a lot of places and then if it still hasn't been put in place as far uh, licensing and regulation in that area then they're going to continue to extend that out and it just sounds like a huge huge freaking mess so hopefully the lessons that we've learned in washington and oregon with uh putting rules out and not going slow and not pulling the carpet out from under us before you know it's it's ready to be pulled uh hopefully we've learned those lessons and the same things don't happen in california but i can already see 
some of the same problems that have happened in other states happening in Cal. It's just a growing pain that we're gonna that every state is kind of have to gonna have to deal with and feel their way through the regulation process. Make the mistakes, try and take the best models possible from previous states. Colorado has been the huge example for uh, for cannabis markets across the nation, and kind of tweaking it to what your local lawmakers are trying to get get across. You know. The frustrating part is, we talked about this in the story before, about not shooting ourselves in the foot with high tax rates, creating a larger black market. It's also the same thing with creating rules that are too strict and don't allow businesses to thrive. That's the other big thing that doesn't allow uh, a can- um, an emerging cannabis industry to succeed where it's at. Illinois is a perfect example of this, of not having uh, having too strict rules, not having enough patience to uh, to support these businesses that have opened up. And then the whole cannabis program just suffers at a whole as a whole. And it's an embarrassment to the state. It's not only an embarrassment to to us on the pro legalization side, pro medical side. It's also an embarrassment to the lawmakers who didn't create a program that would succeed in the end at the will of the people. We should be holding our lawmakers to a higher standard of creating laws that actually work and not playing into the drug war, not playing into the scared soccer moms, the scared soccer dads. Because when we play into that side of things, then the market chokes itself out. The Bureau of Cannabis Control in California put its proposed regulations up for public review and began holding community workshop meetings in Long Beach, Fresno, and Sacramento in September. Massachusetts will implement retail marijuana sales on July 1st once state officials finalize whether certain locales will be able to maintain a marijuana ban in their respective towns. Uh, Steve Hoffman, chairman of the Cannabis Control Commission in Boston, says they are committed to making that deadline. They held its first meeting on September 12th on developing and implementing regulations. Maine would have been the smallest market, and it's unclear whether they'll get it off the ground. Dan Tartikoff, clerk for the Marijuana Legalization Implementation Committee, said state lawmakers said draft regulators uh, regulations were released in September proposing a 20% tax rate. These states already have medical marijuana programs and dispensaries, but soon they'll also have stores that can sell recreational marijuana to anyone 21 and older. Recreational marijuana dispensaries exist in Colorado, which we've talked about extensively. Thank you, news article, which was the first to legalize adult use in 2014. Uh, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, Nevada all have stores opened in some form or another. Also, voters in California, Massachusetts, and Maine approved legalization of recreational marijuana in referendum votes uh, November of 2016 on the same day that Donald Trump was elected president. Typically, it takes about a year for state officials to set up regulations for the industry. In some places, it's obviously taken longer. And that's really kind of... I don't know, that's really kind of misleading to say that within a year... the. Uh, It's not misleading to say within a year the regulations have been set up, but there's this weird period of time after regulations get set up. Usually, this is what happens. After regulations are set up and then a bunch of rules are put into place a short time later, kind of locking everything down, tying everything together. So we'll see what happens in these states when it comes down to the details. The devil always in the details. California, the first state to legalize medical marijuana in 96 and sales for that market are expected to total $2.76 billion this year. Opening the retail market will expand sales dramatically to $3.8 billion in 2017, billion, and $6.6 billion in 2025, according to projections from New Frontier Data. That also means the entire West Coast will be a free zone for retail marijuana as the industry gains its first legal markets on the East Coast. North America is going to grow even greener next year because Canada getting ready to legalize recreational marijuana nationwide. I would like to talk to our flapperhead friends up north who won't allow me to cross the border very soon, too, about legalization. I'm just unsure of where to start there. So if you do have any suggestions, my email, always open to your suggestions, Radio at gmail.com. And I say flapperheads with the utmost of respect. All right, you can blame South Park for that, my Canadian friends. 
<laughs> but uh, in Massachusetts, sales are expected to increase from 106 million to tw- uh, in 2017 to 457 million in 2018, and eventually to 1.4 billion in 2025, uh, 2025, according to New Frontier data. Something else that's to note about this data too is that here in Colorado, we've noticed that we misjudged the amount of money that we were actually going to make from cannabis, that it's been a lot higher than we thought it was going to be. In fact, at one point, we have this thing called Tabor. Uh, It's still in place. It's not at one point. At one point, we almost had to give back taxes because the taxpayer bill of rights, Tabor, um, when the law went to the vote of the people, it said a certain amount of taxes were going to be raised. Uh, we have a deal with the state that says if those numbers are not correct, then something has to go back to the ballot, uh, particularly a refund. In that case, was the ballot asked, do you want to give back a certain amount of money to each person? And we voted that down. The taxpayers didn't want the money back when it came to, can- when it came to those cannabis sales. That, to me, either way, whether the money needed to go... We don't need the money here in Colorado. Let's just get rid of that notion. I was about ready to go into that. We don't need the money that was going to be given back to the people. We already have enough from sales taxes coming in for marijuana. The point of that vote, in my opinion... Of not giving it back to the, of, of not allowing the state to keep it, not giving it back to the people, was to hold the state responsible in their spending. We'll be following Massachusetts, Maine, California very closely. The John Doe Radio Show. With the latest local and national marijuana news and entertainment. One stop for your stoner fix. <laughs> The big story out of California recently has been the wildfires and the devastation that it's caused to some cannabis farms. It's been horrible to see some of the pictures from friends and friends of friends online on Facebook, Instagram, of the devastation that this wildfires have caused, the uh, just ruined crops, and especially at a very vulnerable time for a lot of these growers. I mean, it's Croptober. A lot of the harvests are being done right now. A lot of the work is being taken care of on these farms, and it is exactly that work there's a lot of heavy heavy lifting a lot of man hours a lot of trimming that goes into making sure that you get your cannabis to uh, in oil edible or flower form and my heart goes out to the people in california that have lost anything regardless of being involved in the cannabis industry or not you never want to see devastation like that i think the worst thing I can't think what would be worse. Would I rather have everything flooded and destroyed that way, or would I rather have to deal with a fire? And they're the scariest things to have to think of when you live in certain parts of the country. NPR with the next story. In Northern California, two intoxicants are king. Wine and weed. Both products drive a $3.2 billion a year tourism industry in Napa and Sonoma counties. But as wildfires continue to rage through the region this week, marijuana growers and winemakers are struggling to keep their crops safe. By the way, this article was posted on October 19th. At least 42 people have died in the fires, and thousands of homes and businesses were destroyed since the flames ignited October 8th. Firefighters have begun to contain some fires that have forced evacuation of nearly 100,000 people. The Napa Valley Vinters Association says 47 out of 330 member wineries reported direct damage, and only a handful suffered significant property loss. There are more than 900 Vinters in the Napa Valley. But the situation is more dire for the area's fledgling marijuana industry. At least 30 farms had significant crop losses, says Hezekiah Allen, executive director for the California Growers Association. Uh, I think I got his name right. (laughs) California Growers Association. It's important to get people's names right, goddammit. A statewide trade group for legal marijuana industry. As farmers who evacuated return, those numbers are expected to rise. Many marijuana farmers have lost... Over a year's worth of work during the busy fall harvest, Alan tells Here and Now's Robin Young, which is an NPR show, a lot of folks had plants maybe in their drying sheds, maybe they were in the process of trimming them or sorting them, a lot of work going on in the farm this time of year. As the San Francisco Chronicle reports, there are up to 9,000 pot pot farms in Sonoma and Mendocino County. The region is the biggest driver of California's $21 billion marijuana economy. Cannabis revenues were expected to rise after California voters 
legalized recreational use of the drug last November. Retail sales, as we talked about, begin in January. The industry already had strong roots in California. It was the first to legalize marijuana 21 years ago. We've talked about that, blah, 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 blah. I try to highlight some of these stories, so I skip through some of the small details so we just don't waste time, but sometimes they just get in. And it's just how we do on JDR. California pot growers were who were living in the shadows for years were, were preparing to have a legal, officially recognized business. Growers have invested anywhere from 75 grand to over a million dollars to meet new regulations. Insurance policies for marijuana crops are virtually non-existent since marijuana is illegal on the federal level. California growers are not allowed to put the cash from their sales into banks for the most part. That's what the article says. Um, here in Colorado... Something that I have to point out is that there are local banks who will work with you. And what's in it, I'll have to get permission to talk about some of the things that I currently know because there are some things that are currently in play for the company I work for, Green Dot Labs in Boulder, and for companies that I've worked for before. As I've grown older, <laughs> this is hopefully we don't get too far off topic here, but as I grow older and as I learn more lessons through life, I understand the importance of maybe taking a second to think before you say something because it's not necessarily uh, it's not necessarily the best for your relationship with others in the future. So I will always try to call people out the best that I can. If there's a product or a service that needs to get better or something that's just not up to par, I I will absolutely never lie to your guys' faces and try and BS you because I think one of the most important things about this show is that we inform you and give you the knowledge which then turns into the power and confidence to be able to get out on your own and make your voice heard, whether it's through making rules, uh, lobbying for things, creating a business yourself, whatever it may be, selling that bag on a street corner. No, I'm just kidding. Whatever it is, I want to make sure that you're empowered by what we do here at JDR, and I want to make sure I stay true to, to what I, how I feel and what I think about things and my soul. Sell your soul, John. No, one million dollars. Um, but I, but I definitely think that it's important to point out some things that I've learned throughout uh, the past few years of not only being. I've very lightly been involved on the actual licensed business side of things, but I know from friends and experiences that I've had around them uh, that I can pass along to you guys. So it's it's. We'll have to check a few things first, though. Uh, Back to this news story before we get off topic too much. Uh, One report, heartbreakingly enough, that not only was the home and the crop lost, but so was all the cash savings that the growers had kept on the farm. That's what we were talking about was the banks. Um, This is one of those risks of not being able to put your savings in a bank. There are places here, like I said, that will do business with you, but it's on a very limited basis, and you have to kind of skirt around the fact that you're a cannabis business. I, almost everybody I know in the cannabis industry has had 10, 20 bank accounts at some point in time. They've, they, they've had the bank accounts closed. And that's the frustrating part. So if you get somebody that's willing, that's willing to work with you on things, you don't really want to push your luck too much. And in California, I'm not exactly sure how it is with banks or how it's going to be in the near future with banks. But there is, regardless of anything that I'm talking about now when it comes to working with banks, there is a ton of cash in the industry. Ton, a ton of cash passing from one hand to another in every different situation. You name it. And it's kind of scary sometimes when you sit down and think about it. It's scary for not only the businesses overall and the things that could happen there, but on an individual level, the employees that work for these companies, the situations that some of them are put in. It's sometimes, uh, and I'm not going to say it's a little bit much because just like Trump said last week in a really shitty way, you knew what you were getting into it for. You knew what you were getting into. And that's true to, to a very, I don't know how to put it. It's true to an extent because I do feel it's the responsibility of lawmakers. It's the responsibility of our industry to make sure that we have the proper rules and regulations in place to not only protect the businesses in the industry, but to protect the people that are involved in this also. So 
we can say that, yes, I, we knew what we were getting into, but I can also say that it's partly the responsibility of lawmakers and it's partly the fault of some of these rules and regulations that have been put into place, not allowing banking, some of the uh, the red tape that goes along with uh, regulation as I knock over my phone here. But if we could fix those things and if lawmakers could see the problems that some of these things are causing at, at a very personal level, I think they would understand a little bit more that they need to get fixed. And, I, and some of them do. Some of them see these situations and they take it back to uh, the state level, the municipal level, the, uh, the federal level and try to talk about these things. Obama had already said that the banks need to open up their bank accounts and do business in legal states. But it wasn't something that was forced on or written on paper like this is written in stone. This is what you have to do. So it's frustrating that that's something that we have to still deal with today. Getting back to this story, uh, California wineries suffered less damage than marijuana farms because most vineyards in the area are located in the valleys, which haven't been touched too much by fires. Vineyards also act as a fire break, according to Jim Lapsley, agricultural researcher at the University of California. The way that most vineyards are grown these days is that a gr the ground between the rows will be plowed so it's open ground. It doesn't have vegetation. The vines themselves have liquid in them. The water is being pumped through the plant as it's going into the grapes so there's a natural buffer there. Because the fire started at the end of Napa's harvest season also, uh, Lapsley estimates that 90% of the grapes have already been picked. So that's another thing is that it just hit at the wrong time of season for cannabis growers and fortunately for these wineries they had like 90% of their uh, what is it called what is a, uh, a, a the grape harvest that's what it is grape harvest uh, the unpicked grapes are mostly thick skinned Cabernet according to the Napa Valley Vinters they tend to be more resistant to smoke taint uh, the Napa Valley is known for quality of its wines, though less than 10% of California's wine grapes are grown in the region, according to Agricultural Issues Center at UC Davis. Most of the wine in California's $34 billion industry comes from the Central Valley, a vast fertile area to the east. The real problem in Napa, Napa Valley may not be losing grapes, but losing tourists, road closures, and burnt down hotels will likely keep visitors away during peak tourism season. Lapsley said the wine tasting and tours in most of Napa Valley will still go on, but your wine might taste a little smoky. The John Doe Radio Show. I feel like I'm going a million miles an hour here on the first JDR back. I know that I'm producing it, and I could take my time, which I have. Trust me, I've done a million takes when it's come down to it. So a little bit critical of how I sound, a little bit critical of how it comes across, but you can only do so much. I am still who I am. It's just funny uh, sitting here doing this and then like all of a sudden taking a deep breath and thinking, did I just slur everything I said there going a million trillion miles an hour? But in all seriousness, I'm having a ball sitting here producing this for you. I hope that you enjoy it. Let's get on to the next story. We're talking about government jobs in California. I wasn't going to cover this story because it didn't seem like it was something that was too important. But I think the important part to point out in this story is how many actual jobs are being created in the cannabis industry in California. It was kind of staggering once you actually got into it. Scientists, tax collectors, typists, analysts, lawyers, and more scientists. Recreational marijuana use becomes legal in California in 2018. One of those things to blossom in the emerging industry isn't green and leafy. It's government jobs. This story from The Cannabis. The state is on a hiring binge to fill what will eventually be hundreds of new government positions by 2019 intended to bring order to the legal pot economy, from keeping watch on what's seeping into streams near cannabis grows to running background checks, checks on storefront sellers who want government licenses. Thousands of additional jobs are expected to be added to local governments. The swiftly expanding bureaucracy represents just one aspect of the complex challenge faced by California. Come January, the state will unite its long-standing medical cannabis industry with its newly legalized recreational one, creating what will be the United States' largest pot economy. 
Last January, just 11 full-time workers were part of what's now known as the Bureau of Cannabis Control, the state's chief regulatory agency overseeing the pot market. Now it's more than doubled, and by February, the agency expects to have more than 100 staffers. The agency is moving into new offices later this year, having outgrown its original quarters. It's expected new satellite offices will eventually spread around the state eventually, too. So think about that. I mean, that's, that is absolutely huge. It's huge. I mean, it's creating a brand new government agency, basically, and then staffing that agency now with over 100 people and then soon to come satellite offices. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of opportunity for people. And as I said, uh, the list is just going to keep growing with what kind of jobs they're adding to that because as time goes on, as they realize that they're going to need more people to fulfill these uh, licenses and deal with this paperwork, that's going to grow. So, I, I mean, also at the same time, yes, I do understand and I do admit that we, I don't want a larger government. I don't think some of these regulations that they've put into place are necessary. I don't think that they should be keeping certain people out of the industry. I think people with past marijuana transgressions, felonies, misdemeanors, whatever it is, I think that should be uh, looked away from. I think a lot of those, uh, I guess, convictions should be hidden in states where it's legal. And I don't think it should come into play in damaging you and preventing you from moving your life forward and progressing your life. As we start to unfold these cannabis laws, these are the one this is one of the things that hopefully we're going to be able to look for as a standard is that it's eroding more of the punishments and the continued punishments that happen. The thing in America is we're supposed to have once you go through your punishment, once you're done with everything, you've got off paper, this is supposed to be done. But it's just not. And it's frustrating to not have that happen. And the more that we can minimize that from happening, the better off I think that we'll be in the long run, especially with this emerging cannabis industry. One of the things that we don't want to do is we don't want to eliminate people that have put their blood, sweat, and tears into this. And some of the most knowledgeable people around have gotten in trouble before when it comes to cannabis and would be put on a list of people that are not allowed to be licensed to work in the industry or to own a business. And it's very important that we make sure we take care of those people. And in fact, there are some places in California that are already looking to correct this. I think in Oakland, I pulled up this story from East Bay Times so I could make sure I get this right for you guys, but we'll just basically skim over it. In fact, I'm not even going to really read any any. It'll just be too detailed to get into. We'll get into this in the future. Oakland, one of the places that's reserving some licenses for people that have been convicted of marijuana crimes in the past. So once they start to uh, give their licensing out for legal sales, cannabis offenders are going to have a special place on that list. So this is exciting. It's one of the most awesome, incredible stories that I've heard in the past couple of years. And I just love absolutely hearing what Oakland is doing. Me being a cannabis felon, it's obviously something that's very important to me. And it's two, two things I've learned in this life, and that's don't catch a felony and don't get addicted to drugs. But in all seriousness... <laughs> If you can avoid those two things, you might just do all right. But in all seriousness, um, helping people out with past transgressions when it comes to cannabis, because of how heavy-handed some of these rules have been and how long some of the punishments have been, long-standing, even after you've gotten off paper, have been, I think it's important that places like Oakland, here in Colorado we need to do the same thing, um, other parts of California, Maine, Massachusetts, uh, Nevada, I... The more, just giving examples of places that are coming online, as more and more start to come online, it's going to be incredible to see more and more of these rules get put into place, uh, allowing cannabis offenders into the mix. Holy cow, we want to talk about going a million miles an hour. I had to catch myself there in the middle of that story and be like, but get cannabis films. Anyway, getting back to the story about uh, government jobs and the amount of money that's going to be actually put onto that side of things and the monster that's being created um, with regulation and government. I'm I'm not for a massive government, but this is something that we're just going to have to deal with for the time being. And I hate saying that to you. You're just going to have to deal with it because it's just how the way things work. And if we don't 
want to deal with this, then there's just, there's no other way. There's no full legalization. There's no, there's no pass go and earn $200, period, end of story. There's just, we just don't have that. That's not how the US system works. I get caught up in trying to explain that to some people sometimes. And if you just don't have that understanding that we have to f go up against another side, a side that has just as big, if not a bigger voice than you do when it comes down to regulation and dealing with their voice and not having the things that they say come into play and become rule and law is incredibly hard. It takes a ton of people together for that one soccer mom that's scared for her kid, you know, stumbling across a marijuana dispensary and then somebody giving her a weed lollipop. You know, things that are just probably never going to happen. That mom being scared about that, there's not a single lawmaker out there, maybe a few, that would stand up and say, you know what, this is not happening. And that's becoming more and more uh, of an easy thing for lawmakers to say as we move along down the line. But that one lady or dude, whoever it is, parent, wh whatever concern that they're expressing, but if it's on along the side of public safety, there's not an official out there that is going to go to bat for our side to say that that's bullshit. To, to any heavy extent. It's just not how things work. They get bad press for it. They're not going to get reelected. But as I said, it does become easier for them to kind of speak up a little bit more. So in order to defeat that one voice, it takes a hundred of our people to get in there and silence her. And even then, a lot of the times, she's not silenced because that voice is so loud and it's such a concern. Public safety, I mean, it's like when we talk about... Uh, DUIs or whatever, uh, it, it, laws pertaining to smoking while driving, laws pertaining to drinking while driving. Obviously, you know you shouldn't drink and drive. And no one can sit here and say, you should smoke weed and drive. You know, But there is a massive difference between studies and the, the ability to be able to uh, not drive while you drink and then the ability to drive if you have smoked weed. You know, there's a lot of people out there. Let's just, uh, let's be real. I mean, that's all we can do right now is be real. Period. End of story. If you smoke weed and you're out driving and you're tested, there's a good chance and you get in a crash. There's a good test that you there's a good chance that you're going to get in trouble on that. I'm getting way too far ahead of myself. Go to a million miles an hour here. There's there's a chance that you're going to get in trouble for that. It's just how it's going to happen. Was it a fact that cannabis had impaired you to drive? that you shouldn't have been driving at that time, that you, that it caused you 100% to crash your car, there's a good chance that cannabis wasn't the only cause of that crash. Not as much as you could say when it comes to alcohol. If a person's drunk, they, cr they crash. I mean, your ability is 100% impaired. There are studies that have come out that argue that people who regularly use cannabis are no different than people who, I guess, use prescription pills um, in a sense that you can become kind of normalized to that's how you feel and normalized to your daily routine and getting out and about and not having that inhibit your ability to function. So, and with saying that, I can't see, you cannot sit there and say that to a politician or someone that's on the 100% responsible side of the tracks. There's not a single person out there that's going to argue on that side of the tracks that's trying to be responsible that you should do anything besides just drive while you're driving. No impairment, no nothing, no ifs, ands, or buts. And I agree with that. I do. I, I agree with that. If it's not something that you can handle, period, end of the story, you can't. But I do know that there are people out there that have no problems driving under the influence of cannabis. So when we get into rules, when we talk about the effect that those kind of things have, it's hard to argue that other side. It's almost impossible. So when it comes down to these rules and these laws, it's just something that we have to work our way through. We have to erode the bad ones away and bring in some of these good ones. All right, let's move on. Let's get done with this story. Environmental scientists will be responsible for developing standards for pot growers near streams in California to make sure fertilizers or pesticides do not taint the water or harm fish. An engineer will monitor groundwater and water being diverted to nourish plants. Lawyers uh, are needed to help sort out complex issues involving the state's maze of environmental laws. It's going to be the same thing when it comes down to social use in California. The rules for public smoking in California are some of the tightest of anywhere in the nation. Those are going to stand in the way of social use. 
100%. Just like here in Colorado, our rules stand in the way, our public smoking rules, or I guess private smoking rules. There's no smoking in bars or any, you know, restaurants, anything like that. You can't even smoke within 15 feet of doorways. And in California, there's some areas that even have stricter rules than that. So those are going to be the frustrating hurdles that we have to kind of navigate on that side of things. Uh, jobs, jobs, jobs. Pay varies with positions, can be, uh, but some can be attractive with scientist posts uh, paying over $100,000 annually. Special investigators with the Consumer Affairs Department can earn on average $80,000. Policing cannabis cultivation, legal and not, has been a long-running concern in the state. Recently, Republican State Senator Ted Gaines urged Governor Jerry Brown to declare a state of emergency be, uh, in a certain in one county because of what he called rampant illegal marijuana grows. Um, let's skim through that. This is basically um, more jobs creating on the police side. Obviously, that's going to be another thing that uh, comes with this legalization is adding more and more cops. In fact, here in Denver, there's been so many seizures of weed over the years and in other areas surrounding Denver, other municipalities that they've had to sometimes bring in other ways to store it. Like they've ran out of room to store the weed inside the evidence lockers. How about we just quit taking the weed? It goes back to the whole thing of the soccer mom that we just talked about, Tim. You just heard yourself. All right, um, let's wind this story down. California Highway Patrol expanding training for officers to identify buzz drivers. Uh, key issue will be keeping legally grown pot from moving into the black market. To combat illegal activity, whether through code enforcement or police, they're going to have to invest into manpower. And that's, like I said, going back to the original part of the story, the amount of jobs that are going to be added in California, just absolutely astronomical. <laughs> It's the John Doe Radio Show. How much higher can you get? Something that annoys me to no end and I think is an embarrassment to us in Colorado is that we have not filled this loophole of social use. And I don't know if loophole is the right way to describe it, but basically we don't have any place in Colorado where you can legally, quote unquote, legally smoke cannabis. You can smoke inside your private home if you own your home. I'm pretty sure 90% of landlords have it built into the uh, lease agreement that you cannot smoke marijuana. You can't grow marijuana anywhere uh, in Colorado. And it's something that caught on quite a bit as legalization and medical marijuana. Really, it was with medical marijuana. And as patients and caregivers, as caregivers started stacking patients, uh, more and more plants and more and more grows started showing up. And it became kind of a big issue at a certain point. And now it's come down to last year them regulating just flat out the most you can grow anywhere in the state of Colorado is 12 plants so beyond all the other ridiculousness and some of the red tape that's happened here in Colorado um, the other big thing the, the main big serious issue for me is doing away with some of the felony rules that we have here in Colorado and kind of cleaning those up but we'll get into that in the future on JDR right now specifically though the biggest embarrassment to us is that we don't have these social clubs and we haven't been able to set this example for the rest of the nation and pass this model along something a lot of people may not know about colorado is that we are a home rule state and what that means is that local municipalities basically are given the ability to govern how they want so there's maybe a state rule that's put in place and within this rule you can govern how you would like to so in the case of cannabis, that comes down in the worst case scenarios of cities and counties just eliminating cannabis business completely from the area. And in some cases, there was medical marijuana and dispensaries that had opened up. Uh, in particular, one of the co-founders of Incredibles, Derek, one of the former hosts here of JDR, had a dispensary open up in northern Colorado, and the local municipality voted cannabis businesses out of that municipality, said that anyone that was there had to shut down. One of the only times, and really 
the only time that I can think of where legal businesses have been allowed to be、uh, have been allowed to be shut down by a vote of the people or local government, and it's just. Ridiculous and it's frustrating even now to think back that these type of things happened.、Um, so, getting back to social use, we did regulate social use here in Denver. And next week or the week after, we're going to have Emmett Reistraffer on. He is part of the Initiative 300 campaign. The basic social use Denver is what it eventually became to be known as.、Um, but he's taken this issue on himself、uh, quite personally and tried to run the with the ball. Try to make sure that it happened here in Denver, and it did. We voted in social use, but the city and county of Denver zoned it so ridiculously small and in stupid areas. So basically, we'll get into more of the details. Like I said, when we have Emmett on, and、uh, he'll fill you in completely and accurately about what's happened from point A to where we're at now. But basically, in Denver. It, it, We do have social use, but it's in super limited areas. And I'm going to use this example. This don't run with this, and don't completely quote me on this. But if you're familiar with Denver, then maybe you know like the Denver Coliseum, and you know kind of how that neighborhood is, and how kind of not the greatest part of town it is. So basically, what they kind of said is that may if you want to buy a section of land over here behind the Coliseum in this really crappy area, and then build a building, go through the permitting process, and then pretty much not have an ability to make money off of it once you get it built and opened and licensed. Well, you could do that, and that's what happened. <laughs> and that's so that's what we're facing here in Denver currently is this kind of. Ultra limited and choking rules. I talked about it before when it came to、uh, lawmakers making rules that didn't work, that choked off the med medical marijuana programs or recreational programs, and then also taxes becoming a big issue and choking off the system and allowing the black market to succeed where. The retail market should be the one. I mean, the whole point is if we want to do away with the black market. Why have the taxes so high that people are going? Anyway, getting off topic here. So basically, in Denver, we have that. It's been put in place, but it's on a rule that nobody's applying for these businesses. Nobody's being granted licenses for these businesses. In fact, I don't even think the、uh, the, the the final rules were issued, and I'm not even sure. We'll have to talk with them. I don't even think anybody has actually applied for any of these businesses, a social use business. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the important things that I want to follow is making sure that we stay on top of places that are moving ahead with these things. California, the LA Times gets it. Adults in California and older will soon be able to buy marijuana legally for recreational use, but where will they smoke it? This is by the、uh, the Times editorial board, by the way. Should have mentioned that before I started reading there. It sounded like you were saying that. Under Proposition 64, approved by state voters last year, it will be legal to grow, buy, and sell marijuana beginning in January. However, the ballot initiative included strict limits on where the marijuana could be consumed: not in public places such as streets or in parks, not in a car, not in any space. <laughs> The reason why I tripped over myself on that is because I started to read it in my mind as a Dr. Seuss book. Not in a public place, not in a street or a park, not in a car, not in any space, such as a bar or an office building. How did a leprechaun come from all that? I don't get it. Maybe I shouldn't have taken the dab before this story. I have no regrets. As I said, not in public places、uh, where tobacco smoking is already banned. Either、uh, you can't smoke there. Not on the premises of any building where tobacco or alcohol is sold. Landlords and property owners can also ban smoking in apartments and hotel rooms.、Uh, that's one thing that I forgot to mention when I talked about Colorado and social use is that it's a burden on some of these、uh, hotels and、uh, bed and breakfasts. I know Airbnb, think, places like that. There's strict rules for being able to use marijuana. Even some bed. On the other hand, some Airbnbs and there's even some bed and breakfasts here in Denver that shoot you show up, and on that front counter, on the coffee table, is maybe like two or three bongs. You got a piece over there. Sometimes they're not even cleaned. They're just dirty from the people that were there before. And you're like, oh yeah, this is totally a bunch of stoners live here on this place. It makes you feel kind of at home. If you're a stoner, you're part of the community. 
And that's part that uh, you may have that maybe like, okay, I'm going to set this dirty bong off to the side. I'm not going to use this. I got, I brought my own, but you're still going to feel like you're at home a little bit more than in just, you know, somebody's house where you, you don't know how they feel about weed. Um, so that's some of the problems here in Colorado and I'm sure everywhere across the world that hotels and uh, those type of Airbnbs and things have faced. You're rambling. Basically, the only place other than a private home where one could legally smoke marijuana would be at a business licensed for on-site consumption, such as a marijuana lounge or an Amsterdam-like cafe. Proposition 64 gave local governments the option to permit or ban that sort of on-site consumption, but so far, many California cities, including Los Angeles, have no proposals to allow for such places. This page has supported, they're talking about the LA Times, California's strict restrictions on smoking tobacco in public places so that adults who choose to endanger their own health don't inflict harm on others in the process. We're also supporting the right of landlords to ban tobacco smoking in their buildings to protect people from secondhand smoke. But tobacco smokers always have the option of going outside to smoke. It's neither rational nor fair for the state to legalize marijuana and then make it nearly impossible for people to use it without running afoul of the law. Getting caught smoking in public can result in a fine of up to $250. I think in Denver, it's maybe, I think it's a, is it a $100 fine? I'm pretty sure it's a $100 fine in Denver for, uh, for public smoking. The lack of legal places for people to use marijuana puts a particular burden on renters. I think when I said Denver there, I meant Colorado as a whole. Uh, That's the statewide fine. The lack of legal places for people to use marijuana puts a particular burden on renters who may not be allowed by their landlords to smoke cannabis in their homes. That also could have a disproportionate effect on low-income people and people of color. Uh, Marijuana was legalized in Colorado. Blacks were more than twice as likely as whites to be arrested for using it in public. If city and state rules make it impossible to find a place to smoke marijuana legally, that also undermines one of the key arguments of Prop 64, which was that it's ultimately better for public health and safety to bring marijuana out of the shadows and allow it to be used in a legal, regulated, and controlled way, but without licensed locations for consumption, there is a big gap in the controlled marketplace. That is one of the most oh man i love the la times editorial board for pointing this out this is my number one argument at least on the side of lawmakers doing the responsible thing and making responsible rules if they want to make sure that everything is tracked seed to sale that everything is put together and presented for the soccer mom and the nascar dad for them to feel comfortable i guess it does kind of make sense when it just kind of hit me there the second I started saying it, it makes sense for the th- that other side, for those guys to still want to keep it underground. It does make sense. I get that. So maybe that was a bad example to use. Going back, let's just go back to the point of uh, responsible lawmakers. For everything that we've just talked about, everything that the LA Times laid out, won't get off topic too much. That's when you start to ramble, John Doe. Um, but this paragraph, talking about how it's irresponsible to keep this end of things open, to kind of sweep it under the carpet and cover your eyes is so frustrating. And it's ridiculous to not hear anybody echo this, what the LA Times editorial board has said here. It makes me so proud to see this. I love hearing that. Um, Back to it. Marijuana entrepreneurs are creative bunch and uh, some have come up with a workaround. Members only marijuana clubs where people can bring their own weed and smoke in a private space. They're increasing in number, but there may or may not be legal. We also have a few of those in Colorado. A few of them have been successful in staying open and more so than not uh, more so than more more so have not been successful than have been successful let's put it that way um, the goal of Proposition 64 was to legalize and regulate marijuana. It makes sense to set standards for where on-site consumption may occur. For example, away from schools and daycare centers, to establish rules for responsible operations of such venues, and to issue licenses that can be ro- revoked if a business becomes a nuisance. Uh, something else to think about when it comes to down to regulating these places is that concert venues... There are certain rules that can be put in place in local municipalities or on a state level that could have a heavy, heavy effect on concert venues because these concert venues have liquor licenses and there's probably going to be rules in almost every place 
imaginable right now, eliminating the ability for someone to have on-site consumption for marijuana and a liquor license at the same time. That is going to be the next big step that we see once social use starts to roll out and we see successful models. That's going to be the big thing. So the, the one massive thing that I worry about, because it is something very big to worry about, is making sure that these concert venues we're all love, we all love going to, and we already smoke weed in them anyway, have the ability to keep their liquor license and stay open. And not have some weird inadvertent effect to where somehow they're closed down because they violate rules because they can't keep people with weed out and their liquor sales suffer so they can't keep the doors open on that side of things. It's kind of scary to think about because we've seen examples of things like this happening before. Now, there is a rule in Denver and probably going to be a rule in other places. I'm not saying that these places are just not completely, they completely not going to be allowed to have a social use license, which is what they're calling it in Denver at all, what would happen is that the venue would have to suspend their liquor license for, say, one event. Say, for instance, I was supposed to go to Marilyn Manson on the 19th, but his uh, dumbass decided to let himself uh, have a super massive metal gun fall on his leg and like break his leg or something. So unfortunately, we missed that show. But if that venue would have elected for that show to just have a social use license they wouldn't be allowed to serve liquor now what under it's just you're not allowed to sell weed at this place so why under what imaginable planet would any business person say i'm gonna do away with my liquor license on a massive show like that just to allow people with weed to come in it doesn't make any sense. Zero bit of sense at all for them to do that as a business. So it would be left up to events like maybe the High Times Cannabis Cup and other local cups, which is fine. That's cool. But the venue has to go through so much work to be able to get it done. Would it be worth it for that venue? Probably not. It's probably not going to be something that they want to uh, put man hours in. And if it, if it is, it's probably going to be a cost that's passed on um, to the organization and you know people besides well, high times has a ton of money to work with but a lot of starting organizations and starting events and cups and competitions don't have a ton of money to work with at the beginning um, so it's just scary i just want to make sure that i point out some of the downfalls and some of the the hurdles that we could possibly face here those are a few of them there's also something a bit hypocritical getting back to this uh um LA Times article op-ed, by the way, something hip hypocritical about permitting and collecting taxes from marijuana growers and sellers, but then refusing to license on-site consumption for fear of encouraging drug use. There are legitimate concerns about marijuana users driving while high, which is the number one reason here in Colorado why these facilities, we'll just say that, I, I'm going to refer to them as licenses from now on, or try to. These social use licenses have not been allowed to exist is because people are afraid you're going to drive away high. When you walk outside and see how many liquor stores and how many bars there are here in Colorado, on almost every corner, at least every other block, there's a bar or a liquor store here, and it just strikes you right in the face, slap in the face, as one of the most hypocritical things that we can talk about. Now, I get the argument from the other side that two wrongs don't make a right here oh no well just because we allowed that to happen doesn't mean we should allow some other evil to happen and come into play and it's hard it is we go back to talking about how it's difficult to argue with that side of things public safety so that number one that easily is the is the number one issue that has kept these places from existing here in colorado quick drink of water there excuse me um so and then but then we also mentioned real quickly here the dui law here in colorado with cannabis we did not have a driving while high law specific to weed before legalization once we had legalization hickenlooper our governor made sure that there was a rule 0.05 nanograms per milliliter. If you tested at that, then you could be prosecuted for driving while high. 
The unfortunate thing for prosecutors was that rule took pretty much all claws out of driving while high under marijuana. If they would have left it as before, um, which I, I mean, it, I guess if you're a good lawyer, it didn't really matter whether they changed the law or not, because there's no scientific evidence or reasoning that would show 0.05 nanograms per milliliter with me is the same as a 0.05 nanograms per milliliter for you. So with alcohol, we kind of have this range of like, and I understand some people can drink more than others, so maybe that's a bad example, but it's an example most people can probably understand, that there's this pretty recognized level of this is, dude, you're farked up, man. You Is that the first farked up we've used in JDR again? Bam. All right, get back. It's like, dude, you're messed up. You shouldn't even be standing right now. What is wrong with you? Like, we have that, okay? We have that. But with weed... It's not the same thing. You could see someone at 15, 20, 25 nanograms per milliliter, and, well, more towards the 25 nanograms per milliliter would probably be that they might be high. But 15 nanograms per milliliter, that could be someone's resting level. They could have not smoked weed for 24 hours, and that's what they're still testing at because they use it regularly. So it's unfair to try and prosecute someone with those numbers and without scientific evidence or reasoning behind it. And that's how people in Colorado and in other places that have this same rule, and even probably without this rule because there's no scientific basis for it, from person to person, are getting off giggity, with uh, DUIs. And they shouldn't be prosecuted with DUIs. I mean, and we talked about this before, that you can argue as much as you want. People shouldn't be driving while high. But should we ruin somebody's life because of some arbitrary thought? Scientific evidence going to show that basically if you smoke regularly, you use cannabis regularly, it doesn't have an effect on your driving ability. And then we're going to turn around and prosecute those people because of some stupid idea we have, archaic uh, reasoning behind things. We have to be real about some things. We just have to be real about it. And some of the things are going to be uncomfortable for the other side to talk about, even for us to talk about. Um, so it really took the claws out of prosecutors. And it brought when it brought the attention that these test results and these scientific reasoning was ridiculous. Uh, the Getting to the end of this LA Times article, last year Denver voters approved a pilot program in which Businesses could let customers bring in their own pot to consume on site. Supporters of the ballot initiative said it was an attempt to treat marijuana more like alcohol, which, by the way, marijuana is supposed to be regulated like alcohol in the state of Colorado. Probably at some point have some friends on that have an organization regulate like alcohol here in Colorado that are pushing for these rules to be eroded a little bit. Um, it's, it's exciting to know that there's still people out there that are fighting for these type of things. Um, if I can give them a voice, I would love to. I lost my place, so I was trying to stall there for a minute. Supporters of the ballot initiative said it was an attempt to treat marijuana like alcohol as a legal product that adults should be able to consume responsibly in a more social setting, like a bar. With the passage of Prop 64 in California, they all in California has also said they wanted to treat marijuana more like alcohol. Cities should be open to creating legal spaces for adults to use legal marijuana. Big thanks to the LA Times for that op-ed piece. Next state to talk about with social use is going to be Maine. A new bill to regulate recreational use in Maine would allow cannabis social clubs to open across the state beginning in 2019. However, the proposed bill does not include an exemption from the state's public smoking ban. So it will likely be legal to smoke marijuana in these clubs. The smoking ban extends to vaping as well. So the uh, current legislation would only permit use of edibles, tinctures, or topical cannabis products in these new venues. The current bill, which is in legislative rewrite, uh, and I couldn't find any update for this. This, what's the date on this? Um, 925 is the date on this. And I tried to look for an update on this bill, and I couldn't find it. It's possible that it could have died and there wasn't a lot of news coverage, but I'm not sure the I'm not sure the schedule, the legislative schedule in Maine. So if you have any news on that, send it to me. John Doe Radio at gmail.com. 
Uh, it's a legislative rewrite of a voter-approved ballot measure passed last year would delay the licensing of cannabis social clubs until July 2019. Legalization advocates were disappointed with the delay, but were pleased to find that the club licensing was not removed from the bill altogether. Advocates were also pleased that the bill will allow patrons to purchase and use cannabis within the same venue. Which is something unheard of anywhere else. We did have a slight taste of this in Colorado during the Wild Wild West. The Wild Wild West days. And, sorry, just had to do that. Like the Ganj Gourmet. I've used that example before. If you've listened to JDR in the past or you've been to Denver. What's crazy is that you ask anybody how long they've been here in Denver. It's usually only like a year or two anymore. So if you remember the days of the Ganja Gourmet, being able to go in there and get a medicated pizza, like the day this Mama Jamma opened, the Ganja Gourmet in Denver, I went in there with Paul Token, some of you may know him, hope he's doing fantastic there in Hawaii, went in there with him, he's my caregiver at the time, and we ordered one of the first pizzas that this place was sold, and it was easily the highest I have ever been after eating. Now, I remind you, I don't get really that high off of edibles. I mean, I just have a crazy high metabolism. I can eat like 500, 1,000 milligrams, and it's not something that I really feel until coming down, and then you're like, so yes, yeah, I do understand. I do understand that I'm getting it. It just doesn't knock me off, knock me on my ass like it does some other people. It seems to me like the more body fat, the lower metabolism you had, the, the bigger the effect of cannabis on you. It makes sense in a bunch of different reasons. Anyway, um, I swear to goodness, it was one of the best experiences of my life and it's something I remember to this day and it's something that I would like to pass on or I would like to have be able to be passed on to other people to experience the same type of thing. There's a very select few people that have got to experience medicating on site at a dispensary or actually even medicating or getting high, however, whatever you want to say, at an event, like the High Times Cannabis Cup. The very first time that I walked into the High Times Cannabis Cup here in Denver, and they had the smoking area set up inside of this big warehouse. And you walk through these doors. It was like walking into another country, a, f- a country that was like Weedtopia. And you had to go and smoke weed here. And everybody in Weedtopia was required to congregate at a certain time in a certain area and just smoke together. That's what you, I mean, amazing. If you can experience something like this, I, I highly suggest it. It not only brings a sense of freedom for weed legalization and reforming laws with this, but it brings a sense of freedom to everything else that you do or would like to implement uh, in your life. And that made people over realizing I was over, maybe overblowing things a little bit there. But if you've only been from a place that is closed minded, Never been to public venues that allow smoking cannabis. Never been to Colorado, California, wherever it is. It can change your life to go to one of these things. It's amazing. That's what I hear story after story after story. The same thing of people moving here. Uh, So getting back to Maine here. Basically, uh, the rest of the story talks about the same things that we've talked about when it comes to social use clubs. And uh, we'll make sure that we follow that. Stick to it. So I came across this news story while researching cannabis news about fish being fed cannabis to stress them out less. I'll read the article to you because I guess the article will get to the details of why they did this. Uh, A few things I should point out. I did look at this article at first as a serious article that maybe these people were trying to help animals in some sort of way. As I was finished with the article, I realized zero farks were given whatsoever. And really, it was probably just somebody, uh, you know, whether or not in the most scientific way or not, but just somebody trying to fark around and get some weed from the government and then feed it to fish to see if uh, the fish would react in uh, a positive way. I mean, they did react in a positive way. All right, let's get to it. You've probably heard of edibles. Uh, We'll skip that. Let's talk about edibles, blah, blah, blah. According to a paper published last month, scientists in Lebanon uh, fed Nile tilapia fish pellets laced with cannabis oil to test whether the drugs could make the fish chill the heck out and maybe even grow faster. But what does the tilapia have to be stressed about? 
It's not like it has a mortgage, deadlines, or a Twitter feed full of Trump news, but life can be tough for fish in, in a barrel. Tilapia is farmed intensively, and in a bid to maximize the amount of product fish farmers can bring to the market, some fish pens have become incredibly congested. By the way, this is uh, HakaiMagazine.com with the article. Living in such close quarters can lead to all kinds of nastiness for the fish, including reduced water quality, uh, more incidences of disease, and increasing intraspecific interactions. Translation, fish bullying. All of which is why it would be nice if there were something we could feed the tilapia to take the edge off. Unfortunately, the pot pellets don't quite have the mood-altering effect the scientists had hoped for. For starters, fish-fed THC-laden edibles didn't seem to be surviving any better than fish with... A f- who were fed a controlled diet, which the researchers took to mean that the drugs were not helping the fish deal with the stress of pen life. It's possible, however, that the fish simply built up a tolerance after receiving the same amount of THC every day for two weeks straight. As for growth, the researchers found feeding fish uh, pot oil did not give uh, did give them a metabolism boost. Recreational marijuana users will recognize this phenomenon as the munchies, but they were not given extra food to make up for this metabol- uh, metabolic increase. Uh, the lead author of the study said from the American University of Beirut. <laughs> the fact, I mean, this is crazy that this was even a study. Uh, of course, farmers could give the fish pot and then feed them more food, but doing so would cut into the profit margin. So it's unlikely any fish farmers will be investing in the drug anytime soon. Uh, he spoke with Lebanon's attorney general, the the uh, the writer of this. Uh, scientific study, I guess you could say, asked Lebanon's attorney general, who said no one had ever asked for such a thing before, but there was no law against it, and in the end, police were able to hook up this dude with cannabis from the evidence lockers. Uh, It's just ridiculous. So, I think it's something to talk about, and definitely something for the science community to look into when it comes to helping animals with stress and what kind of mix helps with that? What kind of cannabinoid, I should say, mix helps with that? Because we're already seeing in some dispensaries here in Colorado, and we have for a while, I guess I should say. Um, I know private companies and then a few dispensaries that sell dog treats that have a mix of cannabinoids with them, mostly CBD. All right, let's close this out. John Hill. Thank you for hanging out with me on the John Doe Radio Show this week. We will be back next week, hopefully with a few interviews and talking more about social use. If you have any questions, comments, whatever it is, you can send me a message, johndoeradio at gmail.com. If you want to send me an email, if you have a business inquiry, you should send me an email that way. Otherwise, check us out on Facebook, the John Doe Radio Show, and my personal Facebook page, Tim Martin. We're going to have a giveaway of some seeds courtesy of the man himself, Mr. Bike Holly. Make sure you stay tuned next week for details on that. It'll be some question that we have on the GDR show that you'll have to respond to on Facebook inside of his group. I don't know. We'll figure, I'll figure it out next week. Sponsor opportunities are always looked at and appreciated, but I want to thank you again. If you've listened to GDR from the beginning to the end now, I probably know you, number one. And number two... Hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully I've given you some information that you didn't know before. And next week we'll try to build a little bit more. Segments on growing, segments on hash, segments on flour. I want to talk about everything weed. So thank you for allowing me to talk about it. Have yourself a fantastic week. Until we meet again next time, I'm John Doe. See ya. It's the John Doe Radio Show.